Let us begin this session of our conference again by reading from the sacred scriptures. This afternoon we read the controversial passage in the epistle of James, James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, and reading to the end of the chapter, James 2, beginning at verse 14. As we read this passage, try to place yourself in the years leading up to and including 1517, when this lonely monk becoming the Protestant doctor of theology was preaching and confessing justification by faith alone and the entire Roman church of that day was either opposing him or would be opposing him with the brightest (laughs) minds in that church and incessantly pointing to James 2 verses 14 and following in defense of the doctrine of the Roman church that in fact we are justified by faith and by works. Put yourself in Martin Luther's shoes as this passage was being brought against him. How would you respond to the biblical appeal to James 2 in defense of justification Not by works, but by faith alone. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So far we read sacred scripture. Fellow children of the Reformation, at the very heart of the Reformation of the Church of Christ, the 500th anniversary of which we celebrate this year, was the gospel truth of justification by faith alone. This year, A.D. 2017, is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, of the church in 1517. This is therefore a historic year. It is a year of commemoration for genuine Protestants. Jesus Christ reformed his church by restoring to her the gospel of justification by grace and by faith alone. Since the very heart of the gospel of salvation by grace is the doctrine of justification by faith alone, 
Christ enlightened and emboldened first the reformer Martin Luther and then all the reformers, including John Calvin, to see and proclaim justification by faith alone. All the reformed confessions, including the Presbyterian standards, the Westminster standards, and the Heidelberg Catechism of the Dutch Reformed churches and other European churches, proclaim, explain, and defend the truth of justification by faith alone against the Roman Catholic heresy of justification by faith and by works. Defense of the gospel truth of justification by faith alone was necessary on account of the false doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that sinners are justified in part by the good works that they themselves perform. Today, a defense of justification by faith alone is also necessary because of the introduction today into Reformed and Presbyterian churches, as well as into many other evangelical churches, of the false doctrine of justification by faith and by good works. In North America, this powerful movement that promotes the heresy of justification by faith and by works calls itself the Federal Vision. Federal means covenant, the source of the false doctrine that confesses justification by faith and by works, and that denies justification by faith alone, is a certain doctrine of God's covenant with believers and their children. It is the teaching of a conditional covenant. I'm saying that the heresy of the federal vision, which teaches justification by faith and works, arises out of a certain doctrine of the covenant of God. This doctrine is the teaching that the covenant is conditional. It depends for its salvation of sinners upon the good works of the sinners themselves, and that includes the children of believing parents. This is the official doctrine of a prominent denomination in the Netherlands, the denomination that has the name the Liberated Reformed Churches in the Netherlands. But this heresy is also found and is spreading in the churches in Europe. The attack on justification in Great Britain and throughout Europe calls itself the New Perspective on Paul. The New Perspective on Paul. Spreading this false doctrine is the prominent Anglican theologian N.T. Wright. He has also become extremely popular with Reformed and Presbyterian theologians in North America. Also, the very influential Anglican theologian J.I. Packer is contributing to the spread of the heresy of justification by faith and by works. He is part of a movement, worldwide movement, that calls itself Evangelicals and Catholics Together. And this organization and movement declares the fundamental oneness in the gospel of the Roman Church and Protestant churches. And this movement is also an ecumenical movement. It intends to unite Protestants and Roman Catholics. There is therefore today, I am saying, informing you, if you do not know this already, a massive all-out assault on the Reformation confession of justification by faith and by faith alone. This speech, therefore, is not only a commemoration of the work of God in the 16th century, but it is also a defense of that fundamental truth of the gospel, justification by faith alone, against a powerful attack on this gospel 
from within the Protestant churches. Protestant churches with a name for orthodoxy. The Presbyterian and Reformed churches in North America that are overtaken by the heresy of justification by faith and works are the most prominent and reputedly conservative Presbyterian and Reformed churches in North America, if not the world. The attack on justification by faith alone, therefore, is a powerful attack. Today, just as in 1517, the foes of justification by faith alone appeal to the book of James in the Bible, particularly chapter 2, in defense of their heresy. The biblical power of the attack on justification by faith alone today is the book of James. That should not surprise us. This has always been the appeal, the biblical appeal, of the enemies of justification by faith alone down the ages, beginning at the time of the Reformation. And James does seemingly pose a problem for the confession of the Reformation that justification or righteousness with God is by faith alone, apart from the works of the sinner himself. My speech, therefore, this afternoon is an exposition of the harmony of James and Paul on justification by faith and a defense of justification by faith alone against the appeal to an explanation of James supposedly in defense of justification by works. I may phrase the topic of my speech this afternoon What about James on justification? But I begin with some historical background of the subject. I give you first some church history that sheds light on the Reformed faith's confession of justification by faith alone in the 16th century. Someone has said, he who does not know history is doomed to repeat it. We do not want to repeat that history of the 16th century, and therefore we should know that history. Over the years prior to the Reformation, the church, the one church of that day, basically, committed itself to the heresy of justification by faith and by good works. What was meant by that doctrine is that by one's own good works, or those of other humans, which could be bought for oneself, One had to earn salvation and eternal life. The church used the word merit. To merit with God, which they said the sinner could do, one must have something of one's own to give to God. And that something which everyone had that he could give to God, they said, was his free will. After the fall, the church taught sinners retained a free will, a will that was able to choose for God and for Christ, as well as to choose against God and against Jesus Christ. You will notice that the error of justification by works is always closely related to the error of of the doctrine of the free will of the sinner. Good works were not all that were required for salvation, of course. The work of Christ, especially his death, they said, is also required for salvation. And the sinner received the benefits of the death of Christ by the gift of grace from God. But one's own good works were also necessary for salvation. With the death of Jesus Christ, without his own good works, one could not be justified and could not therefore be saved. The teaching of the Roman church was, and still is today, good works are necessary for salvation. Therefore, 
the human would work during his earthly life in order to merit with God. He would present his own works to God as earning justification and salvation. Now most never worked enough and his good works were never pure enough to earn the salvation that he needed and wanted. Because most human beings never did enough in their working to earn salvation, purgatory was necessary. In purgatory, one paid for a certain aspect of the sins that he had committed, and by the suffering of the torments of purgatory, earned in purgatory the salvation that he did not sufficiently earn during his lifetime. Jesus, they said, did most of the suffering for our sins, but we must also accomplish part of the suffering for our sins. And without our suffering in purgatory, the suffering of Jesus Christ for us was not sufficient. The false church in the early 16th century proclaimed justification by faith and by good works. Now, two aspects of this doctrine are especially important. First, what we now know as the Roman Catholic Church never taught justification by works only. She taught justification by faith, but she added works. Her doctrine was justification by faith and by works. This meant that that church proclaimed salvation by grace, the grace of God. But she denied that salvation is by grace alone. She added works. Works were necessary for justification and salvation. What was vital for the Reformation gospel, therefore, was the confession of the word only. Justification by faith only. Salvation by grace only. Without works. In a way, the entire Protestant Reformation depended on that word only. Rome saw that and therefore raged against Martin Luther when he translated the Bible into the German language and in Romans 8 verse Romans 3 verse 28 added and inserted as Rome thought the word only Romans 3 verse 28 reads a man is justified by faith without the works of the law when Luther translated that verse from Greek into German, he translated it this way, a man is justified by faith only without the works of the law. Rome screamed that that word only is not in the original text and it's not there explicitly and therefore criticized Luther for adding to scripture. But that's one thing that must be noted. Rome never taught Justification by works alone, but it taught justification by faith and works. The second thing to be noticed about Rome's doctrine is that the Roman Catholic Church taught, and still teaches today, that the works that are necessary for salvation, our works, are genuine good works, works that one does with the help of of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now in practice, they added many other works. For example, indulgences, pilgrimages, pilgrimages, and much more. But the official doctrine of the Roman Church was and still is today that the good works that are necessary for justification are the real good works that one does by the power of the Holy Spirit. Rome's explanation of justification, therefore, could be convincing. The sinner is justified by faith in Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ is the main part of our righteousness with God. And regarding our works that are necessary 
we perform them only by the grace of the Holy Spirit within us. Thus, we do justice to the grace of justification, Rome said. One more element of Rome's doctrine, then and now, should be noticed. Its defense of its doctrine of the necessity of good works for salvation in justification, why Rome teaches justification by works. It is necessary to teach this, namely justification by works, Rome has always argued, in order to make the people diligent in living a holy life. To teach justification by faith alone is to encourage the people to be slack in holy living or even to cause them to live careless and wicked lives. The teaching of justification by faith alone, Rome has always said, is dangerous. It doesn't stir the people up to live the way Christians should live. The relentless charge against the Reformation doctrine of justification was that it is antinomian. That word means against the law. And the charge means this, that one who believes justification by faith alone will not obey the law of God, but will break the law of God and be careless about obeying the law of God because I'm justified by faith alone anyway. Be careful, therefore, when you hear the charge against a minister or against a church that he or it is antinomian. That charge may very well be a false charge, indicating the objection that the one who makes that charge has against the doctrine of justification by faith alone and the doctrine of salvation by grace alone. In the book of Romans, chapters 3 through 5 especially, Rome teaches justification by faith alone, apart from our own good works. What is the charge that he immediately recognizes will be the charge against his doctrine? Thou wilt say unto me then, he quickly notices that we abolish the law and that we teach that Christians may live a careless and unholy life. He faces the charge, in fact, you are an antinomian. You promote a careless and unholy life by not recognizing good works as part of the cause of justification with God. What was Rome's biblical basis for its doctrine that justification is by faith and by works? Emphatically and almost exclusively in support of its doctrine, Rome appealed to James 2, verses 14 through 26. Specifically in that passage, Rome appealed to verse 21 concerning Abraham he was justified by works. Concerning every Christian, verse 24 says, quote, by works a man is justified and not by faith only, end of quote. And then verse 25 declares or asks in a rhetorical question, quote, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, end of quote. Abraham was justified by works. By works a man is justified and not by faith only. Rahab the harlot was justified by works, hiding the spies and sending them out another way. There, Rome argued, is the plain biblical truth of justification not by faith alone, but by works. Recognize with me this afternoon how seemingly strong, if not conclusive, in the controversy James 2 is. Nevertheless, Rome had to reckon with Romans 3 through 5 
and with the entire epistle to the Galatians, which teach that justification is by faith and not by the works of the law. What was Rome's explanation of Romans and Galatians? Rome's explanation took this form. Never does Romans 3 through 5 expressly state justification by faith alone. Luther corrupted the passage by inserting the word alone, they said, but the word alone is not in the passage. Also, Rome claimed that the good works that, Rome, that Romans and Galatians have in mind when they exclude good works are only the civil and ceremonial works required of the Jews in the Old Testament. The works that are excluded in Romans and Galatians from justification are not the good works that a Christian performs by the operation of the Holy Spirit. All that Paul intends to exclude are the Old Testament civil and ceremonial laws. Paul does not have in mind good works that are done in obedience to the Ten Commandments of the law of God. Rome, therefore, understands Romans 3, verse 28 this way, quote, By faith, without the deeds of the civil and ceremonial law for Israel in the Old Testament, but with the deeds of obedience to the law of the Ten Commandments, a man is justified. Fundamental to the doctrine of justification of the Roman Catholic Church is that justification in James and Romans are the same. Justification in James has the same meaning that justifications ha justification has in Romans 3 through 5. Justification in James is the forensic or legal judgment of God upon the sinner, giving him the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of Christ in his consciousness, so that the sinner has peace with God. Only the works in Paul and James are different. In Paul, the works are the strictly Old Testament laws that no longer apply to the church, in James, the works are the genuine good works that one does with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now against this doctrine of justification, the devout monk, Martin Luther, reacted. He could find no peace for his soul in the doctrine of justification by good works. He worked. He worked hard. He worked harder than any other monk in all of the monasteries in Europe. But he felt that he came short of the righteousness of God of justification. He fell short of the righteousness that God demanded. He felt, and he did fall short, of the righteousness that God demands. All of the works of Martin Luther, he felt, were imperfect and therefore refused by the awesomely holy God for righteousness with himself. We commonly say about Luther that he knew his sin, and he did, but he also knew the awesome righteousness of God. Luther wrote later on that he came to hate the God of Romans 1 verse 17, whose righteousness condemns guilty sinners no matter how hard they work. Romans 1 verse 17, you will recall, reads like this. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Luther was taught to take and explain the righteousness of God there as a justice that God demands of the sinner. And Luther reacted against that demand because the sinner is incapable of giving to God the righteousness that he demands. 
Then, in his spiritual agony, was revealed to Luther that the righteousness of God is a righteousness that is given to the sinner, not that is earned by him. And that God gives this righteousness to the sinner by means of faith. That's how Romans 1 verse 17 concludes. From faith to faith. With this revelation as to what the righteousness of God really is, cried Luther, the door of paradise opened up to me. God gives righteousness freely by faith, not by the sinner's works. And by faith alone, not by faith plus the good works of the sinner. The righteousness of justification is a gift. Salvation is by grace. This is the gospel truth of Romans 3 through 5 and of the entire epistle to Galatians. Quote, without the deeds of the law, end quote, which means without the good works of of the believing sinner. And the works excluded from the divine act of justification are all works, including the genuine good works that the believer performs by the power of the Holy Spirit within him. Therefore, Luther began the Reformation, which taught justification by faith alone. The Roman Catholic Church responded to Luther and to his doctrine of justification by faith alone with a monotonous appeal to James II. That appeal to James II so exasperated Luther that on one occasion he dismissed the epistle to J- the epistle of James as a right strawy epistle, an epistle of straw an epistle that was not worth much, an epistle that really didn't belong in the Bible. Now that's a judgment that Luther did not maintain. He expressed that in one exasperated moment, but later on he saw his mistake and acknowledged that James is a lawful, legitimate, and important epistle in the Bible and that he would write a commentary on, in fact, a very good commentary. Now I bring this history concerning justification up to date. Today there is a renewal of Rome's heresy and the abandonment of the Reformation's gospel truth of justification by faith alone. This abandonment of the gospel truth of justification is found today in Reformed and Presbyterian churches. There is the open, explicit teaching and preaching of justification by faith and by good works with appeal to James 2. The churches include those who are most highly regarded for their orthodoxy, at least in North America. And these are churches that dominate the supposedly conservative ecumenical organization known as NAPARC, North America Presbyterian and Reformed Churches. The false doctrine of justification arises from and is promoted by these churches' doctrine of a conditional covenant. And that's why they take the name of the federal vision. Theirs is a certain vision of the covenant And their vision of the covenant is that the covenant of God with believers and their children is conditional. The covenant and its salvation depend upon the faith and good works of adults and their children. And because the covenant of God is conditional, justification is not only by faith, but it's by faith and by works. A covenant salvation is partly by faith and partly by the adults and their children's good works and obedience to the law of God. Crucial in this controversy is the harmony of Paul and James regarding justification. In the present day, 
controversy over justification, appeal is constantly made to the passage we read this afternoon, James 2. Those who are teaching justification by faith and works, like the Roman Catholic Church, appeal incessantly to James chapter 2. When we harmonize and understand rightly Paul and James on justification, there are two principles that must govern our explanation of justification in Paul and James. First, Scripture does not contradict itself, and certainly not in its doctrine of salvation, which obviously the truth of justification is, a doctrine of salvation. Romans and Galatians on the one hand, and James on the other hand, are not contradictory. They don't teach two contradictory ways of salvation. Romans 3 through 5 does not teach justification by faith alone, whereas James 2 teaches justification by faith and by the good works of the sinner, both of them meaning the same thing by justification. That's one principle, one fundamental truth that's basic to harmonizing Paul and James. The second principle or truth is that Scripture explains Scripture. Where there is difficulty in understanding a certain passage of Scripture, the Bible itself must solve the problem. And the Bible does this inasmuch as the clearer passages of Scripture shed light on the more difficult passage. Now these aren't principles of biblical interpretation that I have invented. These are principles of biblical interpretation that are taught in every seminary to the students so that they will be able preachers of the gospel or principles that ought to be taught in every seminary. The doctrine of gracious salvation in Romans and Galatians is crystal clear. It is evident beyond all doubt that Romans and Galatians teach the doctrine of salvation. They teach how the guilty sinner is saved from sin. They teach particularly how the sinner becomes righteous with God so that there is no condemnation of the sinner, no damnation of the sinner, but that instead he has the right to eternal life. The teaching of Romans and Galatians is that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ apart from the works of the sinner himself. That is, salvation is by faith alone. In the interests of time, I appeal only to two texts in Romans 3 through 5. One of them is verse 28 of Romans 3. A man is justified by... 3 verse 28. A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, that is, without good works. And then I appeal to Romans 4, verse 5. Romans 4, verse 5. Extremely powerful text in the context of this controversy. I quote, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, end of quote. It is as if the Apostle Paul envisions a man in the pew where he is preaching. And by the influence of the Holy Spirit, this man has become convicted of his sin, the guilt of his sin, is convicted that he is a damn worthy sinner, and that he will be condemned everlastingly unless he is delivered from this guilt of his sin, and cries out, How can I be righteous with this awesomely holy God? How can I be delivered from my state of guilt to a state of innocency? How can I be delivered from hell into heaven? The answer of the apostle is, Don't work, you ungodly man. Don't try working in order to become righteous with God. 
But believe. Believe on this God who in Jesus Christ justifies ungodly persons like yourself. And your faith is counted for righteousness in the sense that your faith unites you to Jesus Christ. Your faith has Jesus Christ as the object. And by your faith you receive Jesus Christ and his righteousness so as immediately to be delivered from condemnation, to escape hell and its punishment, and to enjoy heaven and its life. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then I appeal to just one text in the book of Galatians, undoubtedly the most important for our consideration of this matter. Verse 16 of Galatians 2. Galatians 2 verse 16. Quote, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. The question, remember, is this. You aren't Martin Luther, and I'm not Martin Luther. But you're troubled by the same great issue that Luther was troubled by, and so am I. How can I, a sinful, ungodly man, be righteous with God? That's the question. And if you've never asked that question, there's something desperately wrong with you. And I beseech you to ask that question about yourself this afternoon. How can I be righteous with God? In view of all the transgressions that I've committed in thought, word, and deed, because of the corruption of my nature out of which flow sinful thoughts and sinful desires that I wouldn't want to open up to any other human being but that are open before the holy God, how can I be righteous with God? In consideration of the question of the issue, only the righteous will inherit eternal life, and all those who are unrighteous will be damned eternally. How can I be righteous with God? That's the question. That's the all important question. Whatever other questions you have about your life fade into unimportance in connection with this question. Galatians 2 verse 16 is answering that question. Not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. And then the conclusion of that powerful passage. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I say, the testimony of Romans and Galatians is clear, crystal clear. The guilty sinner is saved by faith alone, without his own good works. And the works that are excluded in Galatians and in Romans are all of the works of the sinner, including his genuinely good works. We acknowledge, we praise God for it. That as believing Christians we do perform good works. But those good works too are excluded from justification. Why? Because your and my good works, even the best of them, are imperfect. And God demands a perfect work for righteousness with himself. And that's evident in the book of Romans. In Romans 4 verse 5 the exclusion of works is absolute. Quote, him that worketh not, end of quote. The description of even the believer with regard to the moment of justification is that he appears before God as ungodly. Ungodly in that he retains an ungodly nature and even his best works have much ungodliness Related to them. They're tainted by ungodliness. 
The ungodly has no good work to present to God for his own justification. Now at issue regarding justification by faith alone, according to Romans and Galatians, are salvation, the cross of Christ, the grace and glory of God, and not least the assurance of salvation. Justification by faith alone, without works, is assurance of salvation. Romans 5 verse 1, immediately preceding the grand chapter on justification, Romans 4, states this, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's the importance of the doctrine that we're discussing this afternoon. Justification by faith alone, apart from our own good works. Only this truth gives to us the assurance of salvation. The man or the woman who is trying to become righteous with God by his or her own good works can never have peace with God. Luther found that out by experience trying desperately to achieve the good works that would make him righteous with God. He was troubled. He stood in peril of eternal damnation in his own experience. But being justified by faith, without his own good works, he had peace with God. That's salvation. But the question remains, what about James 2? I repeat... James 2 cannot contradict Romans and Galatians. Neither does it contradict them. For James means something by justification that is different from what Paul means by justification. Justification in Paul and James is not the same reality. James means by justification the demonstration of justification to other people, not God's declaration to one of the forgiveness of his sins and righteousness with God the judge. I prove that now from James 2. James is condemning members of the church who claim to be justified by faith but who live scandalously wicked lives without repenting. James has in view a man who says he has faith but he has no works. Verse 14. James' argument is this. If we do have faith, the faith which justifies with God, we will show this faith by the good works that we perform. That's verse 18. James is referring to the demonstration of justification. James' concern is that faith without works is dead. And if it is dead, it is no true faith. Verse 20. James calls on us to show our faith. That is to demonstrate it by our works. And when we demonstrate our faith, we demonstrate as well the reality of our justification. Two elements of James 2 prove beyond all contradiction that James does not teach justification by works in the same sense that Paul is teaching justification by faith in Romans and Galatians. Follow carefully. First, in verse 18 of James 2, James challenges members of the church, show me thy faith, show it, demonstrate it. That's his concern, justification with regard to the demonstration of, our, of itself. That's one thing. The second element in James that proves that James is not speaking of justification in the very same sense that Paul uses the term in Romans and Galatians, is this. James, in fact, is teaching that Christians are justified by faith, by works only. I repeat, 
James is teaching that Christians are justified by works only. This is commonly overlooked. A superficial reading of the passage might lead one to analyze James this way. James is teaching justification by faith and works, but he isn't. He's teaching justification by works, justification by works alone. Doesn't he say Abraham was justified by works? There's not any mention of faith there. Doesn't he say Rahab the harlot was justified by works? There's no mention of faith there. And in the crucially important verse, verse 24, James denies that we are justified by faith only and affirms that we are justified by works, by works only. Now if James means by justification, the same as Paul, James is flatly contradicting Paul. Paul says we're justified by faith. And according to this misunderstanding of James, James is teaching that we're justified by works alone. And that's unacceptable. James cannot contradict Paul. The Bible does not contradict itself, especially in matters of salvation. James means that works justify in a way that faith cannot justify. And the way in which works justify is that works show the reality of justification. Works demonstrate the reality of justification. Suppose I say to you this afternoon, I am justified by faith. You have no proof that this is true. You cannot see my faith. But when my life appears to you and is known to you, not as perfect, but nevertheless as a life of good works, you have the demonstration, the proof as it were, of my justification by faith. Because a true living faith always works. Now I give some warnings to make the truth of the difference of Paul and James clear. To explain James as teaching justification in the same sense that Paul has in mind in Romans and Galatians is heresy. It is the Roman Catholic heresy. It is the Galatian heresy. It is the heresy of the federal vision and of evangelicals and Catholics together in our time. Also, Suppose I preach a strong sermon in your church, and I would welcome the opportunity to do that. Suppose I preach a strong sermon in your church on justification by faith alone. And in that sermon, I utterly and totally rule good works out in the matter of justification, as Paul does in Romans and as James does in his book. After the sermon, one of you approaches me and says, against my sermon, but James too teaches, you are for the time a Roman Catholic heretic, and you are spouting the Galatian heresy. Do not explain Paul and James this way either, that Paul is teaching a justification, let's say up there in heaven, objectively, whereas James is teaching justification in the consciousness and experience of the believer. As though justification by faith alone is something that goes on in God's courtroom in heaven, of which I know nothing. But James is talking about a justification that happens in my experience. Don't say that either, an explanation of Paul and James. Paul teaches justification in a sinner's consciousness. Teaches justification in the sense that you know that you are righteous with God. 
you know that your sins are forgiven. Justification by faith is experiential. Justification by faith gives the sinner peace with God, according to Romans 5, verse 1. My good works do not assure me of my justification. I am certain of my justification by faith alone. By believing in Jesus Christ, I have certainty that I am righteous and saved. In fact, my works often tempt me to doubt my justification and salvation. When I examine even my best good works carefully, I can come to some very sorry conclusions. One of them is I only have a small beginning of the new obedience. My conclusion is even about my best good works that I have not sought the glory of God with the ardor and zeal that God deserves. My best works are polluted so that I only have a small beginning of new obedience, the Catechism says. And there's so much corruption and filth and rebellion still in my old nature that the more I examine my good works, the more I'm inclined to wonder about my salvation. The way of faith is to look away from oneself to Jesus Christ. Someone has said, faith is like an eye in the human body. There's one thing your eye can't see, yourself. But your eye of faith is fixed on Christ, his perfect (laughs) lifelong obedience, his atoning death, suffering and death to take away my guilt and shame. Faith looks upon Jesus Christ and to faith belongs assurance of salvation. But good works demonstrate my justification to you and to others. All of this means that genuine, true Reformed churches or Presbyterian churches, such as the Covenant Protestant Reformed Church in Northern Ireland, have a great calling with regard to the confession of justification, the fundamental truth of the gospel of grace, in light of current developments in Presbyterian and Reformed churches worldwide. And true churches of Jesus Christ are uniquely qualified to carry this calling out, especially in this anniversary year of 2017. Preach the gospel truth of justification by faith alone, apart from the works of the sinner. Do that simply because anniversary or no anniversary, this is the heart of the gospel. This is the hinge, as Luther said, upon which all of the gospel of grace turns. The calling of a true church today is especially urgent because of the spreading heresy of justification by works. I'm amused almost. It's not amusing, but it comes close to amusing me that faithless churches are supposedly commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. They won't take a stand for the truth of justification by faith alone if they do confess it themselves. We honor Martin Luther, this monk, walking up to the door of the church in Wittenberg with his 95 theses and supposedly with a hammer nailing them to the door. Will we do that at the cost of the opposition for him anyway, of the whole church of that day, and at danger, with the danger of the loss of his own life. Let us be courageous by our preaching, by our confession, as a church and individually. Nail the theses once more, as it were, to the doors of the church. We must defend the doctrine of justification by faith alone. We must be polemical. We must defend it against the Roman Catholic Church, which believes the same thing today as it did in 1517. We must defend it against the Arminian heresy that has much of the church world by the throat, whose doctrine of justification is really the same as the heresy of the Roman Church. We must do that against the threat of our day, the federal vision, the new perspective on Paul, evangelicals and Catholics together, 
And then we must ourselves live out of justification by faith alone. That's a beautiful thing. That means live in peace with God. Living out of the gospel of justification means having peace with God. Going to bed at night without terror that God may come to visit us with the damnation we deserve during the night. And to wake up with the same confidence and peace. And we live out of justification by faith alone also in that we live an active, obedient Christian life. That's a life according to the law. The law is our standard. That's a life lived not to become just, but that's a life lived in gratitude for the free justification that God has given us. All of this, the Reformation confessed in one pithy line. They did it in the Latin language, and so will I before I interpret it. Sola fide justificat, said fide non sola est. That was the watchword of the Reformation in connection with the harmony of James and Paul. Only faith justifies, but faith is never alone. It always carries with it the good works. That's the harmony. That's the oneness of James and Paul. Thank you.